Isn't it awesome to be part of a church? Last week, we did uh, child, parent-child dedication. We got to, as a church, remind ourselves that we're a part of the next generation. So the church is a beautiful expression of what God wants to do through us together as a group of people that we have more than just uh, people at our home, but we have a whole group of people that are with us. Isn't that awesome? Uh, I don't know what your enduring image of your mom is. I'm sure if you can think back to a great memory of your mom or uh, maybe one of the the signature moments when you were growing up in your mom's house, um, what she was doing or what she was like. Can you think about that for a second? Think about what your mom was doing or what she was do. what would she look like? Or again, like a signature moment that just kind of typifies what your mom did. Maybe it was a word of advice. Maybe it was a word of wisdom. Maybe it was how she prayed. When I was thinking back to my mom, I, I spoke to her a few minutes ago and uh, I got to send her Uber Eats, got to send her Starbucks all the way in Ottawa. So the gift of technology is amazing for that. Um, so mom, happy Mother's Day, love you. Uh, but when I think back to my mom, I was 17 years old. And one of the images that comes to my mind, the, the most clear image of my mind is my mom on her knees with her Bible open in front of a, a love seat in our dining room. This is a place where we weren't allowed to go. The dining room was off limits to the four boys of the McGregor home. But my mom was in there every single morning. And I wasn't up very early because I was 17 and 17 year olds do not like to, mostly do not like to get up early. So I was stumbling around looking for a bowl of cereal and, and all those things. And my mom was always there at five o'clock in the morning. She was going through a crisis. There was, my dad had lost his job. There was some difficulties at home. She was worried about us, the different things that were going on in our own personal lives. And in that season, my mom started a brand new habit of getting up at five o'clock, spending an hour, hour and a half sometimes every morning with God in prayer, interceding for us. And as I think back to that time of desperation, it really reminded me of the kind of person my mom is and the kind of mother she was for me. And so the question I want to think about is in your own times of desperation, maybe you're in a season of deserts or maybe you're in a season of gardens as we just sang in that song. Maybe you're in a season of brokenness. Where do we turn and what do we do when, when it hits the fan? Where do we turn when things are just so pressure packed, when there's desperation, when there's so much pressure on us, where do we turn and what do we do in a season like that? And for the answer to that question, I want to partially at least answer it through the word of God in the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1. If you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn there. 1 Samuel 1 verses 9 through 20. Because I want you to think about your response in brokenness, your response in barrenness or desperation. Where do you turn? What do you do? And I want us to look to an answer, a potential answer, as we look at the story of Hannah in the Word of God in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and do not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Verse 12. And so she kept on praying to the Lord and Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And then Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. 
Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord. And then they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And so in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. This is the word of the Lord. What a cool story, isn't it? An amazing story of a woman that was desperate, desperate for God to answer a prayer, to answer a desire, a desire that had been welling up in her since she was a teenager. She's waited and waited and waited. We know even today that about one out of three women are, are waiting for infertility. They're waiting for God to answer. And so this is a very common issue within the story of God. It's a common issue today. And in that moment of desperation, she does incredible things. And, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of phrases within this because it gives us a picture of the incredible desperation of Hannah. Sometimes we, you know, we read the Bible, we read the word of God and we say, oh, what a great story. But we forget to really enter into the emotions of it. We forget to identify with the pain and the bitterness and the emptiness and the barrenness that she was feeling. And so the text is very clear. It says in her deep anguish in verse 10, her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. This is not like a, a Sunday school prayer. Oh, Jesus, I love you. You are my shepherd. Like this was a weeping, ugly, you know how you have an ugly face when you cry? It was like that. You had the vein on the forehead and the eyes were red. It was, it was a desperate, weeping, active prayer, weeping bitterly. And then it says in verse 12, she kept on praying. She, again, she didn't just pray one pretty prayer. She was on her knees. She was on her face before God. She was praying this probably for years and years and years waiting, kept on persistent in her prayers. And then it says in verse 15, she was deeply troubled, pouring out her soul to God. So much, so much so that as she had all of these emotions, nothing was coming out of her mouth. Have you ever gotten to that place in your life where you were so ready for God to break through that you were so desperate for an answer that you, were, you had all the clarity of what you wanted, but the words were just not coming out? And what an encouragement that one of the ministries of Jesus right now is that he's interceding for us. He's praying for us with words when we don't have the words. So Hannah was in that moment, just crying out her soul, pouring out her soul to God. And yet the words were simply not coming so much so that this great man of God, the priest, right? Eli accused her of being drunk. Now that's adding insult to injury, isn't it? Like she's in the temple, she's doing everything she's supposed to doing, but it's a reflection of the times that Eli would think that she was drunk because there was brokenness in the land of Israel. In this time, we have to understand this is, this is a time of great desperation in the people of God. This is now way past the time when they had seized the promised land, way past the time when Moses handed the baton to Joshua, way past the time when the, when the people of God were following God. And now this is the season of the judges where people were doing what was right in their own eyes. Eli was the priest, and although he was a man of God, he had two sons who were also serving as priests. And if you were with us in January and February, we talked a lot about consecration. We talked a lot about the holiness of the garments of the priests and how they were set apart. They were an example to the children of Israel of how they were supposed to live. That they were kind of the servants par excellence of the people of God, set apart for God. And yet Eli's two sons oftentimes were drunk. Eli's sons were abusing the offerings, the holy sacred offerings to God and taking the stake for themselves. And not only that, adding even the worst part of everything is that they were victimizing women who were coming to worship God at the temple. So this is the legacy of Eli's sons. This is the legacy of the priesthood. And in that barrenness and in that brokenness in the land of Israel, it's not just about Hannah, but it's also about the, the ministry and the faithfulness of God's people at stake. And so God uses the brokenness and the barrenness and the desperation of Hannah to bring about a national deliverance. God answers the prayer of Hannah miraculously and gives birth to Samuel. And as we see in the text, the name Samuel means I asked the Lord and the Lord provided. So the name Samuel is a reflection of the very desperate prayer of Hannah. 
A lot of us, we've heard the name Jesus, even if you haven't ever been to a church before today. Like I met somebody in the lobby today. I've never been to a church before. So isn't that cool? It's first time in church. Welcome. Hope I don't scare you. Hope you come back. You might have heard the name Jesus before. You've probably even heard the name David before. King David is the, the throne on which Jesus stands today. But before there was Jesus and before there was David, there was a king named Saul. And before all of those people showed up, you know who there was? There was a man named Samuel. Samuel, the provided miraculous son, was the one who anointed Saul. He was the one that anointed David. He was the one who kept David in check as David had an affair with Bathsheba. So this was a holy man of God. And it's a reminder that in the corruption and in the silence of Eli and Eli's sons, that God was not only looking to answer a personal story with, with Hannah, but he was looking to redeem and, re, and bring restoration to the children of God through the priesthood. Hannah's personal desperation led to a national transformation. This was a before and after. After, after Samuel was born, God came back and God was kind to his people. And the faithfulness of Samuel led to the redemption of the children of Israel through Saul, through David, and through his ministry. So as we think about Hannah's story, here's the question I want us to think about. Whether you're a woman or a man or a student, married or single, where are you experiencing barrenness today? Where are you waiting on an answer? Where do you feel like you're in a desert waiting for God to provide? Where is your barrenness? For Hannah, of course, it was the literal barrenness of her womb that in this time period, this was, an, this was an issue about identity. This is an issue about purpose. And that Hannah at this time period felt, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting and only God can provide because we've done everything in our power and yet we cannot conceive. So where are you experiencing barrenness? Where are you in a season of a desert today? You might have heard the slogan, desperate times call for what? <clears throat> desperate times call for desperate measures. Can I just, can I redeem it a little bit? Desperate times call for devoted prayers. Desperate times call for desperate measures, sure. But when you and I have done everything in our power, isn't it good to know that we have a God who can answer from heaven? When you and I cannot get the answer from the Canadian government for our immigration status, when you and I simply cannot find the job, when you and I cannot simply get the person on the phone that could solve our problem, that we have a father in heaven who is willing to answer us. Desperate times call for desperate measures. How about this? Desperate times calls for devoted prayers. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The picture that Jesus gives us, the, the command of Jesus is to keep asking, to keep seeking, to keep knocking. Hannah didn't get an answer just like that. This was a year-long battle, years of waiting and years of desperation, years of tears and brokenness and waiting and years of watching and being mocked by the other woman in the household because she was conceiving children to the same husband. Talk about some family drama. She was being hurt all over the place and she was waiting and waiting and waiting. And Jesus reminds us, even through his own example, that as the son of God, Jesus got up early and stayed up late, petitioning his father to move. And so Jesus reminds us to keep on asking, to keep seeking and to keep knocking and the door will be opened. But a year and a half ago, uh, I went through several things that were just all of a sudden kind of crashing around me. I had some health issues, some financial issues. I was trying to solve a problem with the Quebec government. Everyone, anyone had a problem with that before? It's, whoa, that's a, that's a different thing. So I understand waiting on the government to solve a crisis. You get letters and you're like, what is happening? I, don't, I can't figure this out. And all of these things were like an assault. All, it's like three arrows hit me all of a sudden. And, and I was in this season of just like, I, I felt like I got knocked down. And I would love to tell you as a pastor, that in that season, I did like my mom did. I got up at five in the morning. 
and I had my Bible open. I was on my knees in the living room and I was praying. But what I found myself doing in that season was retreating. I got overwhelmed. And I started to watch a little bit more Netflix. And I started to retreat a little bit away from people. And I just was completely obsessed with trying to solve these problems on my own. I was staying up late. I was oftentimes awakened at three o'clock in the morning because all these problems were unresolved. And I had like a tightness in my chest and my mind was spinning and I just couldn't resolve these three problems. And it wasn't, it was going on for months and months. And some of these things dragged on for years. And so I wish I could tell you as a pastor again, that I'm a man of faith and I did all those things, but maybe it will encourage you to know that there's a human tendency to try to solve our problems ourselves. And Hannah's story reminds us that instead of retreating, instead of isolating, instead of soothing herself, what did she do? She got on her knees and she pounded her fist and waited for God to answer. The story is, is two stories. It's the story of the faithfulness of Hannah, but it's also a story of the compassion of God. Because if we didn't have one without the other, it would be an incomplete story. Because this could be just like a Tony Robbins message, rah, rah, pray more, right? Faith and drag it from heaven. But without understanding the character of God, if we don't ground our prayers in the ministry of God's compassion, it just becomes a human effort situation. So let me remind you of a powerful Psalm, Psalm chapter 34, verse 18. Yancey read from Psalm 23 earlier. Just as an aside, if you want to get to know the character of God, and if you want to be refreshed and encouraged to complain, read the book of Psalms. I've been saying this a lot. Recently, we've been challenged to read five Psalms a day, and it's been incredible because you get a lot of freedom to complain to God because he knows about it anyways, instead of solving it yourself. It's a great way to, anyways, a little bit of free therapy. So, I love what Psalm 34 verse 18 says, because before I turn there, let me just say this statement, that even as we think beyond Hannah's story to your story and to my story, that God can bring fruitfulness through the womb of emptiness. We all have a situation where there's a womb of emptiness. Some of it's a literal womb and others of us, it's a job, it's a immigration status, it's, it's, a, it's a divorce, it's a relationship that's strained. It's just a lack of peace. It's an encouragement to know that God delights in bringing fruitfulness from times of the womb of emptiness. So Psalm 34 verse 18 says this, the Lord is close. Who's he close to? The Lord's close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. I want a God who's on the mountaintop with me, but what I really need is a God who's in the desert with me. Can anyone resonate with that? We all want a God on the top of the mountain to take the selfie with us, right? To celebrate, we got to the top of the mountain. We got the job, we got, the, we got our permanent residency, we got the husband, we got the child, we got all these things that we've asked for and prayed for, and we praise God in those moments. There's many of those moments, but there's also maybe an equal amount, unfortunately, of deserts of barrenness, of emptiness, of brokenness. And it's in those times that we have to remember that God is close to the brokenhearted. He's close and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And it's a Psalm and it's a promise like this that reminds me why Jesus prayed with such consistency and such fervor in the garden of Gethsemane as he was about to face the cross. He had an understanding and he had a confidence that his father was listening to him even as he prayed drops of blood. Because Jesus knew, he didn't just believe, he knew in the depths of his soul that God is close to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. Isn't that encouraging? So here's the question once more, where are you experiencing brokenness? Where are you experiencing barrenness in your life? Maybe it's in your health, maybe it's in a job that you're waiting for, maybe it's just in a resolution to a relationship that's strained, maybe it's for a son or daughter who's run away or walked away from their faith. 
Maybe it's just a, a profound sense like I was experiencing a couple of years ago where just it was a swirling dark cloud around you. And it kept you up and it made everything gray and it made everything dark and it made everything difficult to get up in the morning. It's just this heaviness. And so where, I want you to be specific today, where are you experiencing barrenness? Desperate times call for devoted prayers. Instead of isolating from people, instead of isolating from your small group, instead of soothing yourself with Netflix or social media or alcohol or fill in the blank, or instead of trying to solve everything on your own, let's be like Hannah. Let's be like Jesus. Let's continue to ask and seek and knock. Now, what's at stake for us? What if all of us together, when we're in those moments where we're in a desert, where we're in the moments of barrenness, what if we resisted the urge to soothe ourselves? What if we rejected the urge to give up? What if we remembered that God uses our barrenness for the good of others? What would be at stake if Hannah didn't get that breakthrough? The nation would still be in ruins. David wouldn't have been anointed. Saul wouldn't have been anointed. The people of God wouldn't have a leader to look to. Your story and your breakthrough is not just for you. It's for the good of our city and it's for the glory of God. May God give us the strength. May God give us the confidence that he is close to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. May you and I ask and seek and knock until the door is opened. Amen. I want to invite our prayer team to come forward as well as our creative team to come forward. We're going to sing a song of response. I want us to think about what we need from God today. God wants us to ask. God wants us to have faith. God doesn't want us to give up. God doesn't want us to soothe ourselves. He wants us to pour out our soul as Hannah did in her deep anguish and her weeping bitterly. She keeps on praying. She's deeply troubled and she finally gets the answer that she is waiting for. May you and I have the faith to believe that God is going to break through, not just for ourselves, but for the good of our family, our neighbors, and our city. Let's pray together. Our Father, Thank you for the faithfulness and the perseverance of Hannah. Thank you, God, that she refused to give up. Thank you for how she models the persistence of prayer to a compassionate God. So, Father, today, encourage us in our barrenness. God, use this community of faith. Use this church to spur each of us on to shine the light of Christ, even as we wait for the answer. Holy Spirit, would you come near? Would you comfort us? Would you surround us with your love? And would you fill us so that we might better reflect you in our homes, in our work, and in our school for the week to come for the glory of God. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.